comments or ideas or suggestions or uh, anything else you might uh, wish to do. And then I think we can just kind of go through and, and unmute. And I think there also might be questions maybe rolling in on the Facebook page or other, other ways at the library um, where I'm happy to uh, engage with those uh, folks too. So thanks for, uh, for coming out or staying in and logging on on a uh, nice evening here in Wisconsin. I'm really happy to uh, have the chance to talk with you about uh, some of the work I've been doing with uh, my colleagues, um, Ted Carmines uh, at Indiana University uh, and Mike Ensley at Kent State. Um, we're really interested in questions about polarization and, and division uh, in uh, American politics. And we're um, curious about how well the conventional wisdom, that is how well what we're told about the divides in American politics really stack up to uh, some close and careful empirical scrutiny. And so to get started, um, it's uh, clear that there are some very sharp partisan uh, divisions um, in American politics. Uh, President Trump um, has a uh, strong uh, approval rating uh, from uh, Republicans uh, in the electorate. Uh, whereas uh, he uh, is widely uh, disliked, and it is very easy to find uh, photos like this on the internet uh, depicting the president uh, as uh, the second coming of uh, Adolf Hitler. Um, by the same token, uh, Barack Obama uh, still uh, widely admired and approved of by Democrats, and it is just as easy uh, to find those same kinds of photographs on the web of uh, President Obama depicted in the same way as we just saw President Trump depicted. Uh, Obama's approval rating is a little higher uh, among Republicans than Trump's is among Democrats, um, but this is quite a bit different than uh, what presidential approval used to look like um, between the parties um, in, say, the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, and this has led us uh, to have a, a typical conversation about polarization that looks uh, something like this. There's red versus blue. Uh, this map uh, is the 2016 presidential election, blue states for Hillary Clinton, red states for President Trump. And here it looks like there is an, uh, a coasts versus everyone else with a couple of exceptions divide in American politics where the Northeast uh, and the uh, Pacific Coast and a few other states uh, are uh, more liberal and the rest of the country uh, are more conservative. But of course, this map skews how divided people are because any candidate who runs for president and gets one more vote uh, than another candidate running for president in a particular state uh, has that state turn wholly their color. Um, but of course, that's not a good measure of polarization, especially because the states are different sizes. And so if we take into account how many people live in a state, you see that Montana has almost disappeared from the map and Wyoming as well, and California, New York, Texas, Florida, Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, become much more outsized um, in, uh, in, in their importance. So now we've gone from an overwhelmingly red map to a relatively equally divided map by color. Um, but of course, the, the Supreme Court has said that states are not the fundamental unit of democracy, counties are. And so if we look at the county voting, once again, we have an overwhelmingly Republican map. Um, but of course, you might be thinking, um, a lot of these areas are not very densely populated. And so if we take size and county together, uh, this is what we get, where we see large cities uh, taking up a lot of area, most of those being blue. Uh, and now the map is actually more blue than red for the first time uh, in the, the time that we've been looking at this. But all of these still color a county or a state, one color or the other, based upon who wins. If we take into account competitiveness, and on this figure, what we see is the darker the blue, the bigger the win for Hillary Clinton, the darker the red, the bigger the win for Donald Trump, and the purple, the more competitive. Um, this is a pretty interesting map, right? This might be something you would expect a psychiatrist to say uh, to you, what do you see when you look at this map? And what I see uh, as a scholar of uh, political science and communication is a, a divided electorate almost everywhere. And so there's a lot of uh, competitive uh, political counties uh, in, in this country that look a lot different than the red versus blue map that we have. And this has led to a lot of scholarship uh, making the argument uh, that on the one hand, uh, with folks like Alan Abramowitz at Emory University saying uh, the public is deeply polarized. 
the public is so polarized, in fact, that there's dark edges of participation now that are, that are placing the country on, on a path uh, to potential ruin. And by the same token, you have folks like Morris Fiorina and his colleagues at Stanford arguing, this is all overblown. Most people don't care about politics. Most people who do have moderate views. The extremists are not that many. And because there aren't that many extremists, we don't really need to worry too much about polarization. There's not a culture war because most people are either less interested or more moderate than we're told by the news media. How can both of these perspectives be true? That's one of the questions my colleagues and I are uh, after and trying to figure out how to answer. And so the typical story that we get is that Americans are divided by their uh, general worldview as either liberal or conservative or moderate. And so looking at uh, data from the Gallup organization here, you can see that the percentage of people identifying as conservative uh, is the same roughly now as it was uh, back when Bill Clinton was elected president. People identifying as liberal have increased slightly uh, from 17 to 25% or so, and that, that number holds relatively steady uh, through 2020. And the number of moderates has slightly declined as a, a few more people who were moderate now call themselves liberal. But these, this shows a fairly evenly divided electorate from this point of view. At the same time, the number of people who call themselves independents when you ask them which political party do they feel closest to uh, has been rising over time uh, from being uh, the smallest group of voters between Republican, Democrat, and independent um, to being the largest group of voters. Now, when we ask independents, is there a side that they feel closer to, virtually all of them pick a side and virtually all of them uh, vote for the party that they feel closer to, even though they identify as an independent. Uh, in fact, independents who lean Republican or lean Democrat engage in high levels of partisan voting, uh, just like those who are already willing to tell you that they're a Republican or a Democrat. This usual way of thinking about polarization works really well when we're talking about political elites. And so here, I, I put together some data uh, from the US Senate. I'm using uh, the years 2005 and six, so that there are a few more moderates in the Senate than there are now. And so the way to look at this figure is each letter represents either a Democrat or a Republican um, in the United States Senate. And on the uh, horizontal axis, the one labeled economic, the further to the left you go, the more liberal that senator's voting record according to a variety of Washington DC based interest groups. And the further to the right that you go, the more conservative uh, that record. The social dimension, the uh, vertical uh, axis, is one where the lower you go, the more liberal people's views uh, and, and, and votes are in the Senate on social issues. So these, are, these aren't issues about spending, these are issues about moral right and wrong, about abortion, capital punishment, gun control, uh, think, things of that nature. The lower you go, the more liberal you are, the higher you go, the more conservative you are. And so not surprisingly, most of the Democrats are clustered in the lower left-hand corner, most of the Republicans are clustered in the upper right-hand corner. You see, um, if, you, if my cursor is working on your screen, you can see me circling the R that's the furthest to the left. Uh, that's Lincoln Chafee, uh, at that time Republican from Rhode Island, uh, who you might recall ran for president as a Democrat in 2016. Uh, the D, the furthest to the right and the highest up, both, uh, is Ben Nelson of Nebraska, um, who was one of the people uh, who, who gave kind of one of the last votes for the Affordable Care Act and promptly did not run uh, for re-election afterwards. Uh, and then the R in the dead center uh, basically is Susan Collins of Maine, uh, who is facing a tough re-election campaign this year. But as we think about polarization, when we look at our elected officials, they're polarized. Virtually all the Republicans are in the upper right, virtually all the Democrats are in the lower left. There's only a couple that actually cross over in either one of these two dimensions of looking at politics. However, the public organizes their attitudes much more differently. So looking at a very similar kind of scale, we see here each dot is a person who uh, was a participant in the American National Election Study 
Um, this looks relatively the same, uh, whether you uh, do, uh, or whether we make this graph in 1952, 56, 60, 64, 68, all the way up through uh, 2016. There's a, there's a wide range of views. Some folks are liberal on both economic and social issues, and we call those liberals. Some are conservative on both of those kinds of issues. We call them conservative. Some folks are uh, conservative and economic issues, but liberal on social issues. Those are our libertarians. Some are the opposite of libertarians. They're liberal on economic issues, but they're conservative on social issues. These are populists. And there are folks who are just honest to goodness in the middle. Some of the folks who are in the middle are truly moderate. Some of the folks in the middle aren't sure what they think and guess when you ask them their issue preferences somewhere in the middle. The way we calculated uh, the location for each of these dots uh, was by looking at uh, about 10 or so questions of issue preferences in this survey. So questions about taxes, questions about spending on education and healthcare, uh, questions about abortion rights, women's rights, uh, gun control, um, things of that nature. And so the social issues uh, were one set of issues we looked at and the economic issues were the other. And this is what the public looks like. It is not as neatly divided as red state versus blue state, as red county versus blue county, or even as neat, or not nearly as neatly divided as our lawmakers. Remember who are up here in the right-hand corner and down here in the left-hand corner, where there really aren't very many citizens uh, when, when, it, when it comes down to it. So how can we think about this, right? When we go, when we think about this particular figure, looking again at the who's liberal, who's moderate, who's conservative, if we take the categories we were just talking about, the conservatives, libertarians, liberals, populists, and moderates, what we see happening is that the liberals, this is the line with the square points uh, in every four years. So each, each four years represents another time there was an American national election study from 1972 through 2016 here at the end. Liberals, people who were liberal on both economic and social issues, are more likely to choose that they're liberal between being liberal, moderate, or conservative. Conservatives, not surprisingly, are more likely to be conservative. But folks who are libertarian, populist, and moderate, in terms of their issue preferences, all say that they're moderate if you ask them, are you liberal, moderate, or conservative? But libertarians and populists, right? Libertarians and populists are just as different from each other as liberals are from conservatives. Liberals and conservatives are deeply divided on both economic and social issues. So are libertarians and populists. And yet, when we do surveys, both of those groups tell us they're moderate. So this is why when people who are sick of the polarization they see in Washington or in the state capitol in Madison ask, why can't a third party, a centrist, moderate third party, rise up and take out either the Republicans or Democrats in terms of electoral supremacy, uh, our argument is that the answer is most of the people who say they're moderate are actually libertarian or populist, and they're just as divided from each other as liberals are from conservatives. And even the most talented politician would have a hard time appealing to both libertarians and populists in the same election. So we argue that the country is experiencing something that we call conditional mass polarization. There are some folks, the liberals and the conservatives, people who are you know, liberal or conservative on both economic and social issues. These are the folks who are orthodox on those issues. They look a lot like our lawmakers. They're more extreme partisans. They exhibit greater affective polarization, which means that they actively dislike the other side. Uh, we think that they should split their tickets when they vote more frequently, voting for some Democrats and Republicans, those who are the, the heterodox voters, so the, the folks who, um, are the uh, libertarians and populists should split their ticket more than the liberals or conservatives. Uh, the liberals and conservatives should engage in more participation. They should probably selectively choose their media more and also perceive greater levels of media bias. And I'd mentioned to you that the, the state of these people's attitudes is roughly comparable over time. And so here you can kind of see how uh, there are a little bit more liberals now in terms of their economic and social issue preferences than there were in the 70s. Um, the, the percentage of conservatives is roughly uh, equivalent. What started to drop more are the number of populists and the number of libertarians, whereas the percentage of moderates has been relatively steady uh, over time as well. But there are fewer now libertarians and populists than there used to be, which make it even more challenging for candidates running for office to identify those folks because we think they're gonna be the most persuadable when they vote. 
it turns out uh, that the liberals and conservatives are also the people who have the most uh, extreme partisanship. And so on a scale of one to seven, where a one is a strong Democrat, a four is an honest to goodness, pure independent, and a seven is a strong Republican, we can see that in 1972, all of our groups clustered between independent and, you know, kind of a weak independent leaning Democrat. The country was slightly to the left. Um, this was, you know, during kind of the beginning of the Watergate scandal, but really didn't come to a head until two years later. And then we start to see this slow progression really beginning with Ronald Reagan's election in 1980, where the liberals, who were not the strongest Democrats in 1972, have been the strongest Democrats since 1980. And conservatives, who weren't the strongest Republicans until 1980, uh, and even had a, a, a brief interlude in 88, as compared to libertarians, are now by far the strongest Republicans. Now, it looks like economic issues hold a little bit more sway for folks than social issues, as libertarians, the group uh, with the triangle, um, they agree with Republicans on economics and Democrats on social issues. They're a little bit north of the middle. They're a little bit more conservative, whereas populists are a little south of the middle and are a little bit uh, more liberal. It turns out that this matters for how people split their ticket when they vote. People who are liberal or conservative across both issue dimensions were way less likely in 2016 to split their ticket when they voted. So this means they voted for, uh, say, a Democrat, say, Hillary Clinton for president, and then uh, the Republican Senate candidate or a Repub Republican gubernatorial candidate uh, in their state uh, in, in 2016, or, or vice versa, voting for, say, Donald Trump and um, uh, a Democratic Senate or gubernatorial candidate in, in 2016. So the groups that don't perfectly match what the parties are offering are the ones who are splitting their ticket. And the other folks, the liberals are con and conservatives, are the ones who are polarized. The same is true for the change in presidential vote choice between 2018 and 2016. So in other words, who voted for Barack Obama in 2008, but Donald Trump in 2016, right? Um, conservatives and liberals are not the people making this change. It's the libertarians and populists especially who are making this change. They're the folks who were persuaded to try something new uh, in, in 2016. So some folks deeply polarized, other folks willing to give either side a chance. We found that this also uh, affects the kinds of political activities that people get involved in. And so we ask people uh, to list uh, in the American National Election Study, the folks who put that together, it's a large group of scholars, uh, and we all, or many of us kind of make suggestions as to what should get asked, and they ask about different kinds of political activities, like uh, did you uh, put a yard sign up for a candidate in your yard? Did you volunteer for a candidate? Did you give money to a candidate? Um, did you wear a button, you know, uh, or a bumper sticker on your car for a candidate? Um, the, you know, the kinds of, uh, did you knock on a door, you know, for, for, for a candidate? And it turns out liberals and conservatives do this more often uh, than libertarians, populists, and moderates do. So then we started wondering, well, maybe it's the case that liberals and conservatives are just more participatory in general. And there's something about being a moderate or there's something about being a libertarian or populist that just makes people less civically engaged. So then we compared these different groups to how they behaved on questions of civic engagement, not political. So volunteering uh, at a soup kitchen, um, volunteering for a church, um, engaging in um, registering people to vote, right? So things that are civic and not purely partisan. And there we see that there weren't statistical differences between liberals, conservatives, libertarians, and populists, but there was a slight difference between moderates. Some people are just less participatory. They tend to be more moderate in their views and they also uh, tend to show up less uh, for different kinds uh, of civic activities. The differences aren't huge, but there are some notable differences. We also then wondered if people were getting information uh, from different kinds of places. And so we started to wonder about where people decided to learn about politics. It was the case when, so I'm 44, so it was the case when I was growing up that if uh, we wanted to have the television on uh, while we were uh, eating dinner, the news was on, all three channels, right? And so if we wanted to have the TV on, we had to watch the news. And so during this era, say the 50s, 60s, 70s, and up to the mid to late 80s, 
this was the structure of the media ecology for most people. They might have even had a couple of newspapers in their town. They might have had a morning paper and an evening paper. They uh, had a limited choice of television news that was on for them to watch. And during that era, people were less polarized, more knowledgeable, and more participatory than they are now. One reason that changed is with the introduction of cable television uh, in the late 80s, especially, and into the kind of early to mid 90s, Fox News starts about 1996 and starts to really take off a, a year or so later in terms of its coverage of the country. Um, when, when CNN and Fox and then later MSNBC and other uh, options come, they also came with other cable options like HBO or Lifetime or ESPN. And so now at 5.30, if people want the TV on, they could watch the network news on ABC, NBC, or CBS, or they could watch partisan news, right, on MSNBC or Fox that tells, tells them that they're right uh, and the other side is wrong, and, and maybe even the other side is dangerous and evil and must be stopped. Or people could opt out of news altogether and watch Sports Center, the Lifetime Movie of the Week, Real Housewives, whatever it is they want to watch. Uh, and now, of course, that's fundamentally shifted with the advent of the internet. Now, not only could we be emailing or texting, we could be streaming something off of Netflix. We could be streaming something off of Hulu or any other, uh, Amazon, any other kind of source. And so the options have changed, which have made it easier for the political junkies to learn that they're right by selecting to watch news that tells them they're right. And it's made it easier for the entertainment junkies to avoid politics altogether and um, be less likely to show up and participate. So we wanted to know, were there differences in our five groups of, of people, uh, the liberals, the conservatives, the libertarians, the populists, and the moderates, with the kind of news they consume? And we see that liberals, uh, as well as moderates and uh, populists, were way more likely to watch network news than were conservatives and um, were libertarians. So there's a difference in the likelihood that on any given night, liberals, moderates, and populists will be watching the network news as compared to the other groups. When it comes to watching conservative programming, so maybe uh, Glenn Beck's show, uh, maybe, maybe uh, programs on the Fox network, um, those kinds of programs, conservatives are by far the most likely group to be watching those on any given night, whereas liberals are by far the least likely group to be watching those programs on any given night. Liberal shows aren't watched by anybody uh, comparatively. Their ratings are far lower, uh, and um, liberals don't watch them uh, you know, nearly as much as conservatives watch conservative news. And so if, if you're a liberal, uh, liberals like this finding because they often say this is because liberals want to hear the news, they want to hear both sides or multiple sides of an issue, they want to deeply engage with stories, they don't so much care if the news makes their side look good or bad, and uh, conservatives, they say, uh, want to hear that they're right. Conservatives like this finding um, because they say liberals don't need to watch liberal news because the network news is liberal from their point of view. And so um, there are different attitudes about media bias that kind of feed into conservatives' predilection to prefer conservative news and liberals' uh, predilection to, to uh, prefer mainstream network news as compared to more ideological news. So then we, we got curious about this. And so we wondered if um, people chose the news that they watched based on what they thought they were likely to hear. Were they, were they likely to hear that, that their side is right or their side is wrong? And so we conducted a, a series of experiments uh, where we showed people a, a computer screen that looked a lot like Google News or Yahoo News or any other kind of news aggregator site where you just see a bunch of headlines and then next to the headline you see the source uh, of that headline. And so in our experiment, we just varied which headline we paired with each network. People could have, could have chosen to read about an economic issue from Fox, from MSNBC, or one that didn't have a source after it in this particular experiment. And what we found were that liberals were way less likely to choose Fox News and way more likely to choose MSNBC. Um, the folks who 
were self-identified liberals, right? These are the folks who answer that, are you a liberal, moderate, or conservative question, looked somewhat similar to the liberals in the way that we calculate them by their economic and social issue preferences. Whereas conservatives were just the opposite. Conservatives had a less than 10% likelihood of choosing the MSNBC story and a more than 50% likelihood of choosing uh, the Fox story. Um, and, and the conservatives in terms of their issue preferences were more extreme than the conservatives who were just folks who said they were conservative. And then you see the moderates, there's not as huge of a difference between what they chose. Libertarians um, were more likely to choose Fox than MSNBC um, when it came to economic stories. Populists were more likely to choose MSNBC uh, than Fox when it came to economic stories, right? And populists, of course, tend to agree with liberals on economics. Libertarians tend to agree with conservatives. And so there's actually a little bit of selective exposure that these, uh, these heterodox groups engage in, these libertarians and populists, where if it's about choosing an economic story, the libertarians tend to go with Fox or, or, a, or a sourceless uh, story, and populists tend to go with MSNBC or a sourceless story. With social issues, it's just the opposite. Now, the libertarians um, were more likely to take MSNBC over Fox and still take no source. The populists now preferred Fox to MSNBC because now the stories were about social issues where populists are more conservative and libertarians uh, are more liberal. Whereas once again, the liberals chose MSNBC and the conservatives chose Fox and they were extraordinarily unlikely to pick the other side. So we found that there was some of this selective exposure going on. The next thing we did was we actually had people read news stories and then we asked them to tell us how biased they thought those stories were on a scale uh, from one to seven, where four, I'm sorry, I'm sorry it was a scale of um, a, a one to nine, uh, where uh, um, on that particular scale, uh, one through four, would be stories that were a little bit more on the liberal side, so where a one would be really liberally biased, um, and a nine uh, would be really conservatively biased, and a, and a five would be kind of an honest-to-goodness uh, piece of American journalism right down the middle. And what we did was we varied whether we had people read a story um, where they thought it was from Fox, or they thought it was from MSNBC, or they, we didn't tell them where it was from. In reality, the story was exactly the same. The only thing we changed was who we said uh, wrote the story, whether it was on foxnews.com or msnbc.com, but it was actually the exact same words. That's the only thing that we varied uh, in our experiment. And sure enough, the liberals, um, when we kind of told them, you have to read this story, tell us what you think, they thought the Fox story, as you can see, uh, was far more conservatively biased, whereas the MSNBC story was almost right down the middle beautiful, unbiased piece of American journalism. The conservatives, reading the exact same words, found the MSNBC story to be really liberally biased, and they even thought the Fox story was a little bit liberally biased, but almost right down the middle. Libertarians, populists, and moderates more or less saw Fox and MSNBC as hovering around that middle, a little bit uh, conservative um, in terms of when they thought it was on Fox and a little bit liberal when they thought they were watching MSNBC, but not huge differences. And so the liberals and the conservatives were really perceiving bias, but really what they were doing was kind of engaging in a motivated reasoning exercise where they decided, well, this side is, is the news source that doesn't agree with me or does agree with me. And so they either, they're, they're more biased if they don't agree with me and they're just fine if they do. In another experiment, we actually let people pick. So in, in the first experiment, we forced them to watch MSNBC or, or, or read an MSNBC or read a Fox story, when in fact it was the same story. In the, um, in the next experiment we did, we actually let people pick because that's more realistic, right? In, in your life, it's typically the case that people don't tell you the, the news that you have to consume, you get to pick it. And so in that case, we found, if you just kind of quickly look at this, you'll see that there's greater extremes in the no choice condition versus the choice condition. So liberals still saw Fox more biased, but less so than they did when they didn't get to choose. Conservatives still saw MSNBC as biased, but less so than when they didn't get to choose. And so part of the lesson is that when we pick our news, we see a little bit less bias than when it's kind of thrust uh, upon us, which is one of the more encouraging, one of the only encouraging things really that, that we've been finding in a, in a lot of our work. 
We then started to wonder, well, what if there's news that is objectively bad, but it's objectively bad? It's not news that's biased against your candidate. It's just news that isn't good news for your candidate. And the kind of information that we thought would be a, a fair story that could be told, um, but still meet this criteria would be a story about polling data. And so right before the 2016 election, we did a small uh, experiment of about 500 people uh, around the country. And we basically put them into a couple of categories. Uh, we either told them um, that uh, they all read a story that was very similar. The only difference was which candidate was winning in the polls. Either Hillary Clinton um, was uh, winning by four points, Donald Trump was winning by four points, or they were in a statistical tie. Uh, and, and so those are the three conditions. And we, we chose Iowa uh, for a, a state that we uh, were looking at in that particular experiment because there were polls at the time we were in the field that had all of those results. Some had Clinton up, some had Trump up, some had them tied. And so we thought it would be more realistic uh, for voters to see that. And so then we showed them one of those three stories and we asked after they read it, did you think the story was biased? And sure enough, when people saw that their candidate was losing, whether they were Trump voters or Clinton voters, they thought the story was more biased than when their candidate was winning. Um, and then if Trump voters even saw a little bit more bias than Clinton voters uh, when the candidates were actually tied. And so part of the issue in, in polarization is that we tend to interpret information, um, we tend to over-interpret it. We tend, we tend to interpret news in, in a way that seeks to confirm our already biased way that a lot of us will, will see the world. And of course it's true, then this probably won't surprise you, that liberals and conservatives were more likely to do this than moderates, libertarians, and populists. And so part of our exploration of, of polarization has shown us that some folks, roughly half the public, are deeply divided, and other folks, roughly half the public, uh, are, are divided, but not in the way that the two political parties are uh, at the elite level. Libertarians and populists are stuck in a system where each party appeals to them about half the time. And so they're the folks who tend to float in elections. They're the folks who tend to have a more balanced news diet. They tend to see less bias uh, in information, but they also tend to participate less. And that tension is really motivating a lot of what we see uh, in American politics today. And so with that, um, I will uh, stop there and I'm happy to take uh, questions and uh, comments and uh, that, that, that sort of thing. So thanks uh, for your attention. If you have a question for Professor Wagner, please feel free to either unmute yourself or you can use the, uh, the chat box and he can answer your questions. Michael, out of all of the, um, sounds like you do a lot of uh, experiments and collect a lot of data, is there anything um, that really surprised or stood out to you? One thing that we've done um, that I didn't show here uh, was data we've been collecting in Wisconsin. And so in 2018, uh, we interviewed about 2,000 Wisconsinites right before the election and then recontacted about 1,000 of them after the election. And we were really curious about which Wisconsinites split their tickets when they vote. You know, Wisconsin is nationally regarded as a deeply polarized state. We're often called ground zero for the 2020 presidential election. It's really crucial uh, what happens here in our state. And so we wanted to understand who were the people who voted for Governor Walker and Senator Baldwin in, in, uh, in 2018. Who were the folks who voted for now Governor Evers uh, and Leah Vukmir uh, in, in, in 2018? And what we found was that the people who had the most diverse media diet or the most diverse conversation diet about politics. In other words, liberals who watched some conservative news or listened to some conservative talk radio or conservatives who sought out MSNBC or, or liberals who talked politics with some conservatives or conservatives who reported talking politics with some liberals. These were the folks who were about nine times as likely to to uh, split their ticket as compared to those who had a more homogeneous media diet. So the liberal who watches MSNBC 
reads the Daily Coast online and just talks to other liberals or the conservative who just watches Fox um, goes to Breitbart and just talks to other conservatives. And so those folks um, were deeply polarized and, and really don't give the other side a chance. Whereas folks who encounter diverse points of view are way more likely to support candidates from both of the major uh, political parties. So I'd say that was something that was kind of surprising was that the media diet actually does influence uh, who people are willing to select to represent them. So I see uh, one question. Um, so uh, one of the early slides, the percentage of liberals has increased. Um, and couldn't it be that the younger generation is trending liberal? That's a great question. Um, it's almost always the case that younger voters fall into our liberal category, whether the year is 1972 or, or 2016. Um, it is the case that a few more young people uh, than say 30 or 40 years ago um, are identifying as liberals. Um, but the, so when we looked at, um, let me see if I can bring this uh, back up again here. Or do we have the, okay, so, um, okay, let me, oops. Let me just be smarter than the technology for one second and go back and share my screen, there we go. Okay, so then you should be able to see this. So one thing is that, one thing that surprised us was that the youngest average age for liberals was actually 1972. And now, uh, up in 2016 is the last figure here, the average age of a liberal in our uh, categorization is about 43. And so it's not necessarily the case that it's young people shifting this. It's, uh, it, it's really, it tends to have more to do um, with when people came of age. So there's a lot of really great work um, that's done uh, by um, some of the uh, centers on campus for uh, population and, and, and demography uh, here on our campus. And, and one thing that we've even learned uh, from something called the Wisconsin uh, Longitudinal Study, where a bunch of high schoolers in Wisconsin were interviewed decades ago and then re-interviewed over and over, I think four or five, maybe even more than that times over the course of the last several decades, we found that people who, who came of age in more liberal times are more likely to be liberal. People who come of age in more conservative times are more likely to be conservative. So the eight-year-old when Ronald Reagan wins re-election is more likely to be a Republican than a Democrat. The eight-year-old who came of age when Barack Obama won re-election is more likely to be a Democrat than a Republican. And so it tends to be more about era um, but it is always the case uh, that younger people are more liberal um, than older people in our data, at least. But yeah, great question. When I see another one uh, in the chat function, do you have any data regarding fact checking and which news outlets are most truthful? That's a great question. Um, fact checking is a kind of uh, news that has exploded over the last couple of decades. Um, in our department, uh, my colleague Lucas Graves and I uh, actually run a fact-checking site called the Observatory, um, but where we fact-check Wisconsin politicians. And we'll get to, we had to stop uh, when the pandemic began because we couldn't be face to face with our students. But we're going to ramp it back up uh, for the elections in in 2020. Um, but there's a lot of organizations like Politifact, uh, the Washington Post Fact Checker, FactCheck.org, um, Check Your Fact. Uh, there's lots of different organizations out there, and a lot of those. Um, have been studied to see, first of all, do fact checks work? And uh, one thing that we found uh, in our research, uh, in, a, in a paper actually that's just uh, about to come out in a journal led by one of my students, uh, Janice Lee, um, finds that on the, on the one hand, when a fact check is done on a story and people read it, they're more likely to be able to tell us what the truth is. They're more likely to get the facts correct. They're also more likely to think that that news organization that did the fact check is biased. Um, and part of that is because for years, journalists uh, have been communicating to the public that what they do is report what political elites say and let you decide, right? There's, you know, here's what the Republican says, here's what the Democrat says, and we're not going to adjudicate truth. And so a lot of us have learned to judge journalism in that way, whereas fact checkers say, Republican says X, Democrat says Y, here's what's true. Uh, and so people are able to learn the facts, but they also tend to think that those sources are more biased, which might affect uh, their willingness to, um, 
their willingness to trust those sources in the future. Uh, in terms of which outlets are truthful, in, in terms of fact checking, the thing that I think is the, the best thing you can do is see whether the fact checking organization has been verified by the International Fact Checking Network. And so the, the Pointer Institute um, is a, has this thing called the IFCN, the International Fact Checking Network, and they put uh, fact checking organizations who wanna get certified through a very rigorous uh, series of applications where the fact checkers have to prove uh, that they don't allow their reporters to give money to parties, donate to parties, donate to candidates, volunteer for candidates, that they're extraordinarily transparent about who funds them, um, that they're very transparent about the sources they use, that they have a corrections policy that's public and transparent and that there is prominent when they make errors. Uh, there's a set of things they have to do. And so um, those organizations also have to list uh, their IFCN application on their site. And so you can kind of see uh, that in that way. In, in terms of news outlets being the most truthful, um, there there are different ways of thinking about this. Um, I don't know that truthful is quite the easiest thing to unpack. Most news organizations are, are telling you information that's accurate. The question is, what are they omitting from their story that is also accurate? Uh, and, and so um, looking at uh, stories and, and thinking about whether some folks uh, or some news organizations only interview people from one side uh, or, or another or never interview regular citizens or neg never interview uh, experts or relevant professionals. Um, these are all things I think to look at. And so I, I don't know that there's one news organization or, or, or a handful that stand out um, over the rest. Um, one question I see uh, on the uh, chat is, are your findings consistent when looking at uh, men versus women? Um, and there, again, we don't really uh, seem to find um, any big differences. Uh, on, on average, uh, women are um, a little bit uh, more liberal um, than, uh, than uh, men are. And so the percentage of uh, women in the liberal group is a little bit higher, and the percentage of women in the conservative group is a little bit lower, and the percentage of women who are libertarians, populists, and moderates um, is the same, as same as men, roughly. So there aren't really big differences um, there. there, there are, but there are more liberals uh, who are women, and there are more conservatives uh, who are men uh, in, in the data we have from 1972 um, to, through 2016. Um, we've got a question from Beth. Uh, she'd Great. like to know, have you seen any changes in polarization uh, since the pandemic hit? Yeah, um, we saw uh, a little bit of a yo-yo where for a few weeks there was less polarization in, in some attitudes. So um, more Democrats were less critical of President Trump in the first week or two of the main time where most folks were shut down and staying at home. Um, we found uh, that more conservatives at that point were uh, more likely to say they trusted um, the nonpartisan folks like uh, say like Dr. Fauci, for example, um, and they were more likely to say uh, they were wearing a mask. Uh, they were more likely um, to say that staying home was a good idea. And over time, that polarization has crept back in uh, pretty strongly. And so now um, there's, there's, there's no more um, goodwill toward President Trump from, from Democrats. And in fact, he's actually performing worse among Democrats than he was before the pandemic began. And uh, conservatives have started to move back to the right. They've been less trusting of uh, public officials who have gone against what the president has suggested uh, the country ought to do. Um, about uh, the pandemic. And so there's a lot of polarization um, that's taken place there. One area where there's not that was in the news today um, is whether we should change uh, the date of our election. So President Trump um, used about that in a tweet today. Um, and there, whether you are a strong Republican or strong Democrat, uh, in the electorate, there's just no, um, there's no appetite for changing election day. Uh, most everybody agrees that it, it should it should not be delayed. So in some so in some cases that are 
related to fundamental aspects of democracy, such as when's the election, uh, there's less polarization, but on everything else, we sure seem to see a lot of it. Oh, uh, one question I saw uh, on the chat function says, so on, on some of the graphs that were related to the media, we had you know, Fox News, MSNBC, and then a category called no source. And so the question is, can you clarify what the no source column is? So imagine looking at a, a, a computer screen uh, that is something that would be like a, a Google News site where, or a Yahoo News site or, or any kind of news aggregator where the, the website you're at takes news that it thinks you're gonna be interested in, shows you a bunch of headlines for you to then choose what to click on. In our experiment, we would have a headline and then afterwards in parentheses, it would say Fox News, or MSNBC, or there just wouldn't be anything. It would just be the headline, you know, Brewers beat the Cubs five to two, and then nothing. Or Brewers beat Cubs five to two, Fox News, Brewers beat Cubs five to two, MSNBC. Or Trump makes major abortion announcement with nothing, or with MSNBC, or with Fox. And so it's just, it was just a, um, not giving any people anything to go on um, uh, when they decided whether or not they wanted to click on that story. I see a question. Was, uh, um, I, oh, yeah, sure, go ahead. Did, um, maybe I missed it, but uh, did you uh, say how many, how large these groups are? Are, are populists and libertarians much smaller than the other groups? Great question. Uh, I went by it pretty fast. So let me um, go back and just kind of share with you uh, what that looks like. So here <clears throat> on this slide, uh, let me uh, see. Clear from this. So if I do this, so here, this is telling you um, between, so the, the horizontal, or I'm sorry, the vertical axis is between zero and one. Think of each of those as a percentage. So the point two would be 20% uh, up to point four is 40%, 60, and then the one is 100% of the whole electorate. And so for, for most of our time period, the populists are between about 10% and maybe 17% of the, of the population. Whereas libertarians uh, over that same time period, roughly 10%, a little bit bigger during the Reagan era, uh, and then a little smaller, then bigger again during the Obama era, and a little smaller in the Trump era. Um, conservatives and liberals are the two largest groups, right? They're over, in, in 2016, they're more than 60% of the electorate, whereas in most years, they hovered a little bit closer to 50%. And so in, in 2016, conservatives and liberals together were uh, a little over 60% of the country, with, with liberals being around 38%, um, conservatives being around 22 or 3 And so um, that's the way that it looked. But one thing to keep in mind is that when we calculate this each year, we are sort of hamstrung by the number of issue questions that get asked in this particular survey. And some questions uh, stop getting asked. So in 1972, one of the social issue questions was about should women be allowed to work outside of the home? That, that's not a question that gets asked in 2016. So there, is, so, so there are a bit of different questions that make up the social and economic issues. Um, they, they, they tend to correlate pretty highly between year, and so we feel pretty good about it. Um, but there is a little bit of a difference there that is important to be mindful of. All right. Well, excellent. Professor Regner, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, this was fantastic. Oh, my and, pleasure. And great questions, as always. Yes. I always learn from the questions, so thank you. <laughs> Oh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you all for joining us. Um, we've got uh, two more uh, lectures in our election edition series uh, that will take place next month. So please check out our online calendar at midlibrary.org slash events. Um, and we'll be sending out information about those uh, as well. Thank you all again so much for joining us and have a great night.